Well, I'm Gregory Monday and David Sisson, <laughs> and we're here to talk to you about building and protecting a family business dynasty, in particular the role of good governance in family business succession and success. Before we start, one word of housekeeping. For asking questions throughout the webinar, type your questions using the questions section in the webinar panel. We will answer as many questions as possible during our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This first slide represents to us a family business. This picture of a, a tree that's built of roots of former generations who created the business, the founding generation, and the trunk that is the current generation and the branches that reach out to future generations uh, who will benefit from those who have gone before them. It's a pretty awesome picture and kind of a metaphor for the whole family business concept. And I guess just to step back for one second here and explain to you how this kind of came together, um, Greg and I both have a lot of experience um, in dealing with family businesses in, in, in different ways. Um, Greg, in the more constructive, proactive uh, sense, has been doing it all of his career, helping advise family businesses. Um, I've been on the complete other end of the spectrum. I get involved when things go bad. And um, so I have that philosophy. I can see what happens and have a good sense of what things could have been avoided to get there. Again, Greg looks at it from a different way and sees what can be built, and we try to meet somewhere in the middle. But um, because we both dealt with the dynamic of, of family businesses and giving our advice and kind of using that as our legal framework, it was an interesting topic for both of us to come together and talk about. And governance is really where it all starts. And again, this, this shows that this picture really, again, is a good representation about how interconnected families are. I really like to, when, when we do uh, business governance planning, business succession planning, really focus on the positive. And so that slide represents the positive. And this next slide represents the positive as well. Uh, while we were putting together this presentation, we did look for empirical research regarding family business uh, governance. And I actually had an opportunity to speak with a Professor Larry Brown of Georgia State uh, who's done some research on this. And in one of his white papers, um, he concluded that uh, better governed firms have higher operating performance, higher valuations, and pay out more cash to their shareholders. So if the rest of our presentation didn't even exist, how could you resist um, that objective? Well, what is a better measure of success for a business than higher operating performance, higher valuations, and um, more cash to the shareholders? And while it seems obvious, unless you have that mathematical formula there, <laughs> I, I don't know that it becomes as clear. <laughs> that's, not, that's not true. We will try to disclaim things uh, that are said for only comic value and are not true. That is one of them. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, we found when we were researching uh, family business governance was on a, um, a website for uh, uh, the National Venture Capital Association. It was a website called A Simple Guide to Basic Responsibilities of VC-Backed VC Company Directors. And they advised, and remember, this is the National Venture Capital Association. I mean, they, they're out to help their their uh, association members make money off of their portfolio companies. And they say that, quote, application of good governance practices will help build better companies. And conversely, companies whose governance processes are not in order will likely suffer discounts in merger and acquisition negotiations. So just looking at, at it from the economics, it is better to have good governed companies. We're going to show you how that also leads to better succession. This is kind of our graphic of what we view uh, the, the scene of a, a family company that has been kind of destroyed through family discord and poor governance practices or unsuccessful succession. It, remi it always reminds me of, of Thomas Hobbes and his insistence on uh, the importance of governance in society. And, and some of his quotes about, about what life is like without, without good governance, kind of like the Lord of the Flies, you know, concept. 
And he says, without government, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And for someone who's ever been a minority shareholder in a family business that does not have good governance practices, it, it, that, that quote could fit perfectly. So what we're going to talk about when we talk about good governance and how that leads to succession planning, it really requires uh, three kind of legal disciplines looking at governing documents, so what's typically thought of as business organizations law. Second, uh, contracts, contract laws, especially contracts among family members, but also contracts with third parties. And then finally, estate planning documents. Traditionally, those are three separate areas of legal practice, but for good family business governance and succession, you really need to bring those three areas together. Now, you'll see that we'll be um, talking to you about nine recommendations, nine takeaways um, as part of this presentation. All three of these areas will cross um, each of these nine recommendations. They all have to fit together, um, and they involve sometimes different attorneys in our firm coming together and sharing their talents to you know, help make this happen. That's right. We have, fortunately, um, none of my clients has ever uh, been involved in litigation um, in terms of documents that I've drafted, families that I've worked with in, in planning. But we do have clients who come to us uh, with litigation issues, and David and I work together on those. But in the planning process, I like to say, instead of bringing David in and introducing him as a litigator, I like to consider them as risk management, really. And that is, it's uh, a person who has kind of... Not as sexy a term, but sometimes... <laughs> someone who has seen the bad, uh, the, the bad that can come out of poor planning and can help you identify those risks and, and other risks as well. We have provided you with materials. Um, we think they're thorough, uh, but they're, they're not, quite as, uh, not quite as thorough as the picture there. Well, we're going to start with a cautionary tale. The best thing to start with. Um, and we'll, we'll go half a world away uh, because uh, family business disputes are all really the same in a lot of important ways. They, they all involve uh, fathers and mothers and brothers and sons and sisters and brothers and, and all the combinations. And you put this all together, and no matter what the situation of the country or the business, um, there's a lot of commonalities. So this is a very good example because it's on a massive scale and something um, you know, that some of us may not be familiar with. Uh, the richest man in uh, India uh, uh, was Dhirubhai Ambani, and he was a rags to riches story. The Horatio Alger of uh, India started with almost nothing, built a little textiles business with his um, cousin, and they shared an office that was about 20 square feet with one desk. And from that, he built a multi-billion dollar company that at one point was represented um, uh, about 5 or 6 percent of the gross national product of India. Massive, massive company. Um, and uh, one of the richest men in the world, definitely the richest man in, in India. Uh, and somebody who um, saw ahead and um, uh, had anticipated things before they happened, helped build a... a energy and petrochemical business in India when there, there wasn't one before. Um, started out pumping gas and looked across um, some fields and, and saw a couple of uh, oil rigs in the distance and just thought, you know, if I could do that someday and bring this on a big scale, what would that mean? And he was only a teenager at the time. But again, he built this massive business and it became this huge conglomerate, uh, really the, the, the powerhouse of India. And so what happened with this visionary um, who thought of everything, had every eventuality covered? Greg, as you popped up on the slide here, he what died, happened? Died without a will. So um, hard as it is to believe, it's, al it's also why, easy to believe. Why did he? But yeah, you, well, you ask why? I, I do ask why it happened. And <laughs> Greg, you should ask. maybe you have a couple of theories I on why it happened. I have some theories about that. Um, clearly, he had no homos collection that um, he needed that, to that's one possibility. divide up among his heirs because that's usually an important motivator. He had no cat uh, to provide for, and so there was no pet trust possibility. And by the way, in Wisconsin now, we do have pet trusts important uh, in statute uh, since, uh, since last a year ago in July, so that's good. Also, he obviously never went to one of those free um, state planning uh, seminars that they give. But w what uh, did he have, even though he had no will in this huge company? Look at these two guys. 
uh, the next generation. And you'll see from our slide, there's literally a column of fire between the two of them. <laughs> That's not a good sign. So these brothers, uh, Mukesh and Anil, Mukesh uh, on, the, uh, on the left, the older brother, Anil, the playboy, is on the right. Um, together they were a really good team when Dad was alive. And uh, by all accounts worked very well together, uh, both bright men and uh, capable in a lot of ways of leading the business. But when he died without a will, um, they were uh, left to drift. And pretty quickly things degenerated. Um, and this is a company that was uh, largely privately held, but, um, but had about 15% of its uh, stock publicly owned, um, a lot of foreign investments as well. Uh, but early on, uh, there were uh, battles in the boardroom as older brother Mikesh tried to oust younger brother Anil uh, from the board. Things got so bad, finally, um, that th the two brothers just couldn't stay together anymore. So who stepped in? Mother. Uh, and mother said, you get this part of the business, uh, son, and you get this part of the business. So uh, Anil took um, communications and uh, financial services and some other portions of the business and um, older brother Mukesh had um, Reliance Industries itself, um, the big business, and the, uh, the energy portion of the business. Wasn't roughly a 50-50 split, but a pretty significant split. And, um, and, and there were problems um, that uh, followed with them the next several years. And things got pretty nasty. Finally, by uh, you know, 2009, um, they had, uh, uh, things had degenerated so much that they were suing each other and, um, uh, you know, we can, we can uh, uh, think about the consequences as well. Um, there was finally an assassination attempt on uh, younger brother's life and the, the press went to great lengths to say this really wasn't part of the family feud, it was somebody else that was trying to kill him. But the fact that they would actually have to mention that, that it wasn't really his brother tells you how bad things had gotten. Finally, uh, younger brother, uh, as part of a contractual dispute that the two were having, um, decided to turn off power in uh, a large portion of the country. Uh, this was a fight that they were having over uh, an allegedly uh, illegal deal that older brother had struck with the government. The younger brother, in retaliation, um, had um, shut off power, um, had, had sweated people out in the streets and took uh, newspaper ads out in about 15 of the largest newspapers around the country. Um, saying how his brother was responsible, accusing the prime minister of colluding with him and uh, essentially bringing the company or the country to a, a standstill. This is not an actual um, quote, but it's, uh, it's pretty close. So uh, finally, the prime minister stepped in and said, you guys got to figure out your family feud. The whole company, the whole country is uh, suffering as a result of it. And uh, eventually things died down after a $2 billion uh, defamation suit was dismissed. They finally decided to get along. Things are in kind of a um, tentative freeze right now, but uh, many years after the fact, uh, the effects still linger on of that family feud. And so y you would think that this company would just be destroyed as a result of this. I mean, everything I've explained so far uh, kind of suggests that this is a company that couldn't work, uh, or a, a collection of companies together um, that, would, that would implode because of this family feud. Things got so bad that they, in the in the commonly owned building um, of uh, uh, of Reliance Industries, they each took separate elevators up. This, that's another graphic here. So, so Greg, why didn't this company uh, or, or collection of companies ultimately fail? Well, yeah. We, so we we watched what was happening with Reliance Industries, and we kind of expected, okay, the company's going to collapse, and then we'll have a good story about estate planning. You know, you should make sure you have your estate plan in order. Um, or else your family company will fall apart. And actually, um, uh, you can see there it pretty much tracked uh, the, the rest of the markets and, and, and now is doing, uh, is, is very successful and is, is doing well. And so we thought about what does that mean? What does that say? Why did that happen? Uh, notwithstanding all of the family problems they had. And what we realized was because a part of the company was traded on the public market, it had to be operated like a public company. And so they had independent board members. They were engaging in you know, corporate uh, governance best practices. They were required to, um, to make public reporting. And, and so what we realized was that 
just as good governance can overcome a lot of crises in a business, good governance really can even overcome the absence of an estate plan or a succession plan. It's not something we recommend, but it shows you how strong that is. And then we kind of did the mental exercise of, okay, what if he had had a will in place and had done estate tax planning but did not have governance systems in place? And really, uh, we think that that probably would have been a worse situation. And so, so to us, the, uh, the, the moral of the story is how important good governance is uh, in, in, in any crisis, but even as a, a, the building blocks toward a successful succession plan. And then when it's coupled with uh, proper estate planning and contract planning and a business organization planning, it can really be a very successful um, way to operate the business and to achieve succession. And so, um, just following up on what Greg said, the three um, building blocks that we mentioned in the beginning of the presentation here, governing documents, contracts, and estate plans, are the three-legged stool. And you can balance yourself on any one or two of those legs, but only if all three are together do you have a really solid foundation. And so just another kind of lesson that we draw from literature, uh, Tolstoy starts out Anna Karenina with uh, the quote, happy families are all alike, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Um, that, that I think that applies to family businesses as well in a way, um, but the, the key is that uh, you don't know exactly where the problems are going to come from. There are no off-the-shelf documents, either state planning documents or business organization documents that are going to be that are going to be appropriate. It really requires a unique approach to each family and each business to um, find out where the potential risks are and to address those risks appropriately. So let's look at another example of family discord. Come closer to home to the United States and see if we can get a, put our finger on what the problem might be here. This is an obituary for a woman named Josianello, and, and here's what the obituary reads. She uh, passed away peacefully at home. She was a loving and faithful wife of 68 years to Vic Anello, who preceded her in death. And she is survived by her son, AJ, who loved and cared for her, daughter, Ninfa, who betrayed her trust, and son, Peter, who broke her heart. So you, you, may, you may be using an obituary to, to, uh, to settle an old score. Um, you probably have some family discord. It, it all... Uh, comes down to who writes the history afterwards. And I think we can we can see that there were some problems in the family. Here's and then another example. Similarly, another example. The picture is from the greatest film ever made. Uh, uh, but the um, the the story at the bottom is local, and it's a, another example of uh, how crazy people get in the uh, in, in the immediate aftermath of the death in the family. This was a true story where the resident called police after his two siblings got into a heated argument Sunday morning around 9.20. The altercation led to a brother throwing and breaking the urn containing their mother's ashes on the sidewalk. The caller told police he and his brother were able to get most of their mother's ashes off the sidewalk and into a plastic bag. So again, people get crazy in the aftermath of a, a family death and you can speculate that alcohol might have been involved at some point here, which leads to only one of two conclusions. Either that they uh, were still drunk at 9.20 a.m. on Sunday morning or they had started early. Neither is good. But with a family business, there are more at stake than just, uh, just the decedent's ashes. And, um, and it's important to remember uh, that kind of irrationality. So when, when we take a snapshot of a family business, uh, this is where it usually starts, uh, an organizational or company chart, um, because more often than not, family businesses involve multiple entities created sometimes for the financial benefit of family members, but it all fit together in a way that's important. Right, and so the governance plan really needs to be consistent th throughout the whole business, including those uh, affiliated entities, and um, it, it also needs to... Um, the succession plan also needs to be consistent throughout the whole business. And, and Greg had mentioned, back to this slide again for a second, uh, Greg had mentioned uh, the, the uh, solitary, brutish, nasty life of a minority shareholder. 
Um, I represent minority shareholders in disputes, and, and often, um, you know, when I sit down and talk with someone who has an issue with the majority, uh, the first question I'll ask is, can you tell me how all these companies fit together? And um, more often than not, they really don't know. I mean, there's only a vague understanding sometimes that people who are actual shareholders of the company and on how much they own of each entity and how everything fits together. And um, I've many times had to request this kind of information from the company in order to get a handle on uh, what it is. And that, that tells you something as you're thinking about governance as we talk about these issues going forward. Um, having everybody be informed and knowledgeable about things is critical uh, to create harmony. Yeah, the, the OECD says that the hallmarks of good governance are um, transparency and accountability. And a lot of family business experts then add to that um, involvement. So one of the things when you're when we're looking at how the company is structured, how the business is structured, I'm sorry, and, and the constituent companies, we also look at um, exit strategies. We're, we're going to talk a lot about exit strategies throughout this. Uh, the picture is somebody being shot out of a cannon. Not the best exit strategy, but it's one. <laughs> and it's not always of, of the cannonball's, uh, you know, own choice. but. Really, when we're looking at the structure, we do think about how people are going to exit or how the business is going to be divided at some point because people always exit a business. You know that you're, it's like what people don't talk about a lot is that you always leave a marriage. Um, you either get divorced or die. And it's the same with the business. Um, you're, you're going to, at some point, leave that business. and that is a really good thing because uh, it will mean that you've you've been successful, you've retired, you've, uh, I mean, it can be a very good thing or um, it can be an unexpected thing. But either way, it's, it's crazy not to plan for how every owner of the business will exit the business. And that includes things like uh, the form of the entities that make up the, con the, the constituent entities that make up the business, the state of formation matters. We have one more, one more story. quick example, this, and this looks like one of the joke, one of the joke slides we have, but it's not actually. Yeah, very true. Um, nasty shareholder fight over the direction and ownership of uh, Archie Comics, a uh, multi-million dollar company, uh, started out by two friends, and uh, by the time we got to third generation, uh, it ended up being run by a widow who had inherited. Um, one family line of the business, uh, the 50% um, of the company owned by that one line. And the other line was uh, inherited by a grandson of the original founder. And these two didn't get along very well. Uh, Nancy Silbercleet had been a former school teacher when she tried to get involved in the business. Uh, John Goldwater, the other partner, gave her deference in the beginning, but they, they didn't get along. And um, the allegations led to um, lawsuits filed on both sides, $100 million defamation lawsuit. Um, allegations that, among other things, uh, Nancy Silbercleet uh, brought along a former football player to be her muscle, uh, used colorful language at work, um, ordered a male employees to drop their pants, and had her dog defecate in the office. In, Those in are just a few of the more. In the art in the department. Art department. <laughs> this is a little bit of an indictment about what she saw in the art department. <laughs> Allegations on the other side as well, but um, pretty soon business wasn't the focus anymore and everybody in the company was drawn into this battle and uh, outsiders were commenting as well. Yes, yeah, so a New York Times article that I, I read on this, I, I remember remarking. So what they had done was for three generations they had had 50-50 ownership and 50-50 uh, co-CEOs and, uh, and the, two, the two owners were also the sole board members. And so it, it, it worked for two generations, but it failed in the third generation. And so I read this quote in the New York Times, quote, I have to wonder how much of the succession plan was in place, said Joanna Draper Carlson, a comic book critic and blogger. Two CEOs can be a recipe for disaster. And what struck me was that the person who said this, a very insightful comment, was a comic book critic and blogger. And I thought, you know, <clears throat> If somebody whose job is to review comic books and, and she can identify that having a co-CEO situation is a disaster, 
Where were the attorneys and the other business advisors on this? So before we get into the nine recommendations themselves, uh, I think we'll, we'll start here with uh, an explanation of this control hierarchy that I think is really insightful. Greg? Yeah, so it's just a little bit of corporate law 101. Now, this is how a corporation is set up. Um, uh, the, the statutes um, separate these, these powers. A limited liability company, which is also a common way to hold a, a business or constituent parts of a business, can be set up like a partnership, which is different. It can have um, the owners run the business. But it's flexible enough to be set up as a, in the same way as a corporation. And I really feel that the corporate system is, a, is an elegant system of governance. And we'll talk about why uh, we think that that works so well. Now, if it's just a, an LLC that's holding a piece of real estate that's rented by one of the companies, and then maybe you don't need to set up this structure. But we're talking about the, the primary business that um, is really the, the, the heart of the, the primary company that's the heart of the business. And whether that's a corporation or an LLC, it really does make sense, especially when there are multiple owners, to set up this kind of uh, hierarchy separation of powers. But here, here's a big picture look at what control is really all about in a, in a corporate setting. Yeah, so a lot of people kind of when they, especially founders, think about shareholders run the business. Shareholders don't run the business. They're really, what people are thinking about are kind of four different roles. And at the top of the shareholder hierarchy are uh, the people who can vote the shares. Now that's not always the people who own the shares. So for example, shares could be held in a voting trust. And so we're talking about the people who can actually vote the shares. They're kind of at the top of the control hierarchy because they elect the board and they oversee the board and they can remove and replace board members. But they don't really do that much else. I mean, they vote, they elect the board, they hold the board accountable, but they usually meet once a year. They're only required to meet once a year. And the other things they can vote on are um, mergers and uh, major transactions involving the company and uh, adopting changes to governing documents. So important, really important rights, but they don't come close to running the business. Second is, is the board. So the ship, those who can vote the shares elect the board. The board also doesn't, quote, run the business, at least doesn't operate the business day to day. Most boards meet four to six times a year. They can only, the directors can only act collectively. Usually you don't have directors signing contracts for the company or binding the company in that way. Usually directors, the board is uh, authorizing the company's executives and officers to carry out um, a transaction that the board has approved. The board's picture is kind of a bigger picture. They are approving budgets. They're approving business plans. They're holding the executives accountable. They appoint the top executives. They compensate them. Then they can remove them or discipline them. But they're not running the business on a day-to-day -day basis. So then the next step down are the executives and the officers who are actually running the business on a day-to-day -day basis. But they are accountable to the board, and they have to answer to the board. And their authority, even under statute, um, a president uh, is, is required to obtain his or her authority from, um, from the board. And that can either be a broad grant of discretion or it can be on a transaction by transaction um, basis. And then finally at the bottom of the control hierarchy are those who own beneficial interests in the stock. So for example, I, I said if you had a voting trust, the uh, trustees of the voting trust would be at the top. They're the ones who can vote the shares. But at the bottom of our control hierarchy would be the beneficiaries of the voting trust, those who own the beneficial, the economic interest. And really, they have very little power. Uh, sometimes their only option is actually to, to litigate if they believe that one of these parties above them has breached their fiduciary duties. That's, a, that's not a lot of authority. That's a, that's a clumsy way to proceed. Um, and it just kind of shows you how uh, shareholders really are minimized in terms of operating the company. But when you look at who gets the economic benefit of the company, the, um, 
the picture is, is flipped over, the chart is flipped over. So you have the beneficial owners at the top. They're the ones who are going to get the dividends each year. They're the ones who should get the profits from the sale of the business. They'll win if the business appreciates. Their likely return will be better than that of executives, but executives and officers are the next ones down. They're compensated to run the business on a daily basis. This is their livelihood. This is their career. And so they're compensated quite well, but within the def within uh, defined um, parameters. Next down would be the board. Family business board fees are not um, going to be close to what the executives are being paid, um, at least not on a gross basis. They may be on a per diem basis, but given that the board is only is only providing services a few days a year, or maybe a total of a, a week or a month a year. Uh, their gross pay is and return from the company is going to be much lower than that of executives. And finally, the voting fiduciaries, the voting fiduciaries like the trustee of a voting trust may receive some kind of fee for their services, but a, a lot of times uh, they won't receive anything, especially if they're family members. Or for example, if the voting rights are split from the equity through the use of voting and non-voting classes of stock. The, let's say you have 1% voting stock and 99% non-voting stock, those individuals who own the voting stock and who vote those shares are not going to be given extra compensation for exercising those voting rights. So I think that actually when you, when, when you analyze, and when I've seen it in practice, it really is an elegant system. And when you have a founder who is wearing all of these hats and owns all the stock and votes all the stock and is the only board member and is the only uh, CEO, when you start to talk about succession, you have to educate them about these different roles so that they can understand, start to understand how that, what succession really means and how those ownership rights and those economic rights and those governance rights could be divided among family members in a way that makes a lot more sense than if you were just taking the whole ownership governance block and dividing it up in percentages among the, the descendants. The title of the presentation is Building and Protecting a Family Business Dynasty. And in the first half of this presentation, we talked to you about the problems that can arise when there isn't good governance and explain kind of a self-evident proposition that having good governance is a good thing, but how do you get up, how do you go about rolling up your sleeves and creating a plan? Because as Greg said, for generation one, these things are much less important, but if you're interested in building a family dynasty, you have to think about the next generation and the generation after that. And it's difficult sometimes to even start the conversation because uh, an owner and founder of the business can feel naturally extremely protective about that, like the head of any household starts to take on a feeling about ownership that isn't, doesn't really connect with the idea that everybody exits a business eventually. So it becomes difficult to even have that conversation with someone about how to go about creating a structure where you're giving up some control, where you're planning for the future. And these nine ways that we're talking about, these nine important goals are, I think, a good way to start that thought process or that conversation. And it starts with number one here, uh, the one that's maybe the most obvious, uh, but critically important. And that's knowing the objectives. Yeah, as I've worked with family businesses, we really came to the conclusion that there were reasons to own a family business. I mean, why not sell the business, invest in the market? What is it that people derive out of family business ownership? And it really comes down to four things, and they don't always appeal to, they don't all four appeal to or apply to every family business owner. And that is cash flow. Uh, so that could mean compensation. That could mean dividends. That could mean repayment of loans that a family member has made to the business. The cash flow in some respect. Two could be wealth accumulation. In other words, uh, the appreciation of the business with the idea that at, at, at some end point, the owner is going to sell his or her share of the business and achieve a better total return over that time than they would in some other long-term investment. Third is occupation or career, and this would be focused on the uh, working for the business and having opportunities to either start at a higher level or learn a particular business, have an in with a business, career, or market 
that you otherwise wouldn't have the chance to pursue. Uh, for example, if your if your parents own a professional football team, uh, it's a real unique opportunity then to be able to uh, get into uh, that that organization and continue on with that career. An opportunity that uh, a lot of people wouldn't have the opportunity to do. And then finally, um, the uh, legacy. Um, Nancy? Yeah. We're getting a... Oh, well, we're fixing this technical problem. <laughs> so uh, legacy, it, it, it is always one of these four things. I, I think it's hard to come up with a different goal or objective. But here's the important thing. Um, if you're being transparent and you're building a governance plan for a family business and you have family members already involved in the business, why wouldn't you want to get everyone involved? to understand their different goals and objectives. Um, so in mentioning, I, I just want to touch on legacy for a, a minute here. Um, legacy is the one that's the irrational one. I mean, I shouldn't say irrational. I should say it's the non-economic factor. It's the one where you want to um, be involved because of the family name or what the family has built. It can also apply to the football team example. It can apply to a chain of hotels that has your family name on it, um, or it can apply to uh, just a well-known business in a in a family town. Uh, but that one has to you have to take account of that one as well, and you can't um, put a number on that. So well, you have a hypothetical business here run by father and mother. They have three daughters and a son. Um, every one of those kids in the next generation may have a different primary goal. You know, somebody may have a career, maybe a, an attorney or um, architect, and um, they're going to hold on to their shares, uh, but they're not going to be involved in the day-to-day -day business. One may be the HR manager or the sales manager, um, so they may be much more focused on a career or an occupation. Um, mom and dad may be at a different point in their lives now at this point when they're handing off the baton and they were before. They may have different goals and objectives. So if you're putting together a plan and you're involving everybody, you get buy-in at the start, you have the greatest chance of avoiding a minority shareholder conflict in the future. If everybody's been involved in creating this plan, they're going to be less likely to challenge it later. And, and this can, um, I realized this one time when I was working with a family uh, that was run by uh, the patriarch and um, the the children were working for the company, but they were not in particularly uh, high executive positions and, and didn't seem very um, uh, motivated or ambitious to, be, to, to become the, the CEO after father died. And so uh, when we talked to father about what would happen to the business in the event of his death, he said, well, sell the business. And when we talked to the children, they said, no, we want to keep the business. And I said, well, do you would you want to run the business? And they said, no, we would hire outsiders to do that. And, and that seemed odd to me. It seemed like kind of a risk. And then as we drilled down a little bit on it, I realized that they loved their jobs. They loved the family business, and they loved what they were doing. They didn't want to become the, 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 the king or queen of the company. They just wanted to have that family environment where they knew they could come to work every day with people who liked them and who understood their limitations in terms of the time that they needed to spend with their families and, um, and, and what they wanted to do with the company. And so for them, it really was that, that occupation career and also the compensation that they would receive that would be difficult to reproduce if they sold the company and invested their um, portfolio in a marketable securities portfolio. Another quick example was a situation where we had a family member who really wa wanted to be involved in the family company, but did not like the risks that the family was taking with some of the, uh, the way the business was going. This person wanted to take her chips off the table, but still wanted to be involved in the company. And so what had happened was it really come to uh, conflict because of this person in shareholders meetings constantly saying, you're moving too fast, you're being too aggressive, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this. And yet that person didn't want to sell out because they wanted to be involved in the business. What we realized finally was that person's biggest role with the company was on the charitable giving side. And so we were able to buy that person out of the company but make that person the president of the company's 
uh, a private foundation. And that person then became kind of the face of the company in all of these, uh, these charitable giving events and um, was very much a part of the legacy of the company without um, continuing to have her capital at risk. So know the objectives. What flows naturally from that um, is, is rule number two. Be fair, not equal, do what makes good business sense. I'm having another technical difficulty. <laughs> we can't advance. So um, nobody's going to agree on fairness. Um, that's why we have jobs um, to fight over <laughs> what's fair. OK. Um, but uh, when you at least try to be fair, and again, when you're transparent about it, and everybody knows that you're working towards that goal or objective, people tend to buy into it and accept it. Uh, and that means sometimes making hard decisions, uncomfortable decisions, uh, but good business decisions. Yeah, and what you're going to fight against is you're fighting against two very different philosophies. One is kind of a Marxist principle, and that's usually the shareholders who are not involved in the business, and their feeling is sometimes more dividends, more dividends, more dividends, or as, as Marx uh, said, or, or Paris Hilton might have said, um, from each according to his or her ability to each according to his or her need. Uh, that's, not, that's not a good system. But what's the flip side of that? But the flip side of that is the person who is working, the CEO who's working so hard, that family member. You have to be careful because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so um, now Hobbes, uh, uh, our big fan of government, uh, was a monarchist. And monarchies can work in the founding generation. They work really well. Don't work so well after that when, um, when there are su successor owners, multiple owners in the next generation. And that's where you really have to be careful about this and then put in place the checks so and balances. So what's fair? You look internally uh, amongst the family, what's perceived as fair, and externally amongst other um, employees of the family health business. If, if they like what's going on and think this is a place where it's still staying at because it's run rationally and fairly, what are the kinds of things that, you, that, that fairness dictates? Yeah, obviously allocate authority wisely. Second, compensate fairly. Don't ask your family members to make um, sacrifices for, uh, for the, the business when there are other family members who are not working for the business. And, and, but recognizing, too, that individual shareholders need to have some return. You know, those who aren't actively involved in the business have to be getting something out of it. So this point number two about fairness isn't, isn't um, you know, a formula or anything. It's more of a concept of use it as a guiding principle at all times. It has to. Um, you have to be thinking about what's fair for each stakeholder. And also it can be a process. We'll talk about uh, the importance of having independent directors or an advisory board, and that's where the process can be uh, fair for comp family member compensation. Oops. Oh. I, I did want to make the point that provide a reasonable return. In addition, it does not matter if people inherited their shares. There's nothing in the statutes that says if you inherited your shares, then uh, you're not a real shareholder. Uh, they, people are shareholders if they own if they own shares, and you can't get caught up on how they got those shares. You have to be fair to the, the shareholders as well. So flowing right out of uh, fairness is the idea of checks and balances. And it's supposed to work in the government, and it should work for governance as well. Right. So these are the next few slides talk about different elements of that control hierarchy we were talking about. And so management of operations, we're talking about the, the, the executive authority. Define and limit what the CEO and other executives can do. Uh, base, their, base their advancement and their compensation on merit. If their family members use contracts so that everybody knows what their deal is. And, and uh, just kind of uh, parenthetically here, um, we used to have Aaron Rodgers in the slide. We didn't change it for this presentation. And we didn't we, cut him after last game. <laughs> this was a while back we made this decision to uh, uh, switch to Ms. Uh, uh, Merkel. But um, yes, but base it on merit. It doesn't matter how old the family member is. Um, and uh, you know, if, if, if there's going to be somebody who's going to be leading in the next generation, uh, make sure that uh, you, you recognize and respect the fact, as I said, 
you have some external optics to within the company and everybody else is going to be watching what you do. Uh, talking about Talking about boards, you can have a board of directors that is a governing board, a fiduciary board. That's what we like. We kind of we like the super friends concept. Perfect well, example. Somebody well, brings something different to the table, and and this is usually the way that it's picked. Let's get somebody with some HR experience. Let's get somebody with some finance experience. Can we put a lawyer on there? And, and somebody who breathes underwater. <laughs> and so the the the. the Board is independent, or there's a, there are independent board members uh, who can help with those difficult family decisions, and it is diversified. And in the middle of a shareholder fight, if you're going to appoint independent board members, minority shareholder, shareholders are going to be naturally skeptical about the independence of anybody that's brought on. But typically, we tend to understand what independent means. It means somebody you know without a stake in the outcome. And people understand and typically respect that. So it's also important for uh, business founders or the senior generation uh, or family members who are multiple have multiple owners at one generation that the board structure does not necessarily have to be and the and the uh, terms of election do not necessarily have to be the statutory default where the person with the most votes gets the seat on the board. There can be classified seats that uh, specific branches of the family can elect. Um, your bylaws should state how many directors, what their terms are going to be. The terms can be staggered. You can specify that there have to be independent uh, directors. And if the family or the, the, the founder cannot bring themselves to appoint a governing board with uh, independent directors, then probably the next best thing is at least to have an advisory board, which can provide some of the advantages of a governing board, such as connections in the com community, expert advice, objective advice, and they can also be those people that you turn to when you are ready to put independent directors. There's a sudden death. They're there. They know, um, they know all the players. They can step in. There can be continuity. And they can provide um, another independent sounding board even if they aren't full-fledged board members while first generation is around. Um, they, they can they play an important role in ease and transition everybody into the comfort of having that independent board. And then this, this slide is just a, um, a reminder that in a state plan, and remember we're, that's a big part of this too, that now in Wisconsin there is an easier way or a more effective way to hold family business interests in a trust. This triangle shows the traditional uh, trust uh, arrangement where you have the settler, the grantor at the bottom left corner, who originally has the property, the family business stock, and transfers that to the trustee at the top of the triangle there. And then the trustee holds and manages that family business stock for the benefit of the beneficiary. I like to use corporate fiduciaries, but there's always been a problem that corporate fiduciaries don't necessarily like to hold family business stock. They don't want to sit on family business boards. They don't want to try to uh, vote that stock. They also don't like the idea that they're holding a trust that has all its eggs in one basket. Now there's a, a new role under Wisconsin statutes that you can appoint to a trust called the directing party or directing parties. And that is uh, either one or more individuals who can actually direct a trustee as to any matters relating to the family business stock. And it relieves the court trustee of that potential liability for making those decisions regarding family business stock. As long as, they, uh, as long as the corporate trustee follows what the directing party has instructed them to do with respect to voting the stock, holding the stock, investing in more stock, or selling the stock, then the trustee is relieved of liability. Uh, another important tool in the arsenal, particularly if you have a large family uh, with several shareholders, is to have a family council. Um, you may have one representative of the family council that uh, sits on the board uh, at, at any given time. I don't know if this is a picture of the five families or one family. <laughs> um, but uh, having that buy-in uh, from, from those more passive shareholders who might be a little bit dis disconnected from the company um, creates uh, a vehicle for getting information, um, gives an opportunity for different people to rotate into that role and for everyone to feel like they have a stake in the company. Um, the times that you have the greatest opportunities for minority shareholder disputes are where there's a small group of people fighting for power or a large group of people in a, 
and a bunch of them who don't know what's going on and are left to form their own opinions because they're not informed. Family counsel can be a good way to avoid that. And then finally, uh, when you're looking at those checks and balances, again, look at it uh, globally so that you're uh, devising a system that works for each of the constituent companies in the entire business. Number four in our rules here, this one seems very obvious too, as many of them are, get into writing. Uh, why not? Uh, it's amazing how much more life it takes on when somebody puts something in writing. Um, if I'm uh, advising a minority shareholder, um, but that person, um, you know, has, has an issue, but has, has signed an agreement where they've, you know, conceded that this is what's going to happen in the event of the sale. People tend to live by that. Uh, it, not, not in every instance, but there's something really important about seeing it in writing and realizing, you know, I. I Yes, I might be able to get this thing undone or thrown out or something, but this is probably what I need to live with. And uh, it's a next step uh, of translating an understanding into a, a writing uh, that can mean the difference between a, a fight or, uh, or harmony. And on the positive side, written documents, governing documents help the family live with best practices. They help them get used to best practices, having meetings when they're supposed to have meetings, giving notice when they're supposed to have, give notice. And then on the other side of it, on the negative side, um, when there are problems, they can go to the documents and if the documents are thorough, they can avoid those problems. They answer the questions. They solve the dispute in themselves. Not uncommon at all uh, in the middle of a, a shareholder dispute to have a, a employee of the company, the family member, um, who isn't performing well uh, is, is, is terminated. And uh, invariably will say, I, I thought I had, an, and it, dad already died, I thought I had an agreement uh, that I would never be fired. I'd have lifetime employment. Well, it seems kind of ridiculous, but is it really in the context of a family business? Um, but if there was an employment agreement that covered that, it would pretty much settle any kind of dispute. Mm -hmm. um, difficult to, to bring up while everybody's around and alive, but something that everybody wishes that they had after the fact. So we have an easy example for this. Um, so we'll we'll take a kind of a vote on this next slide. Okay. Yes. Um, here's a great example. So when we'll plays Monopoly, and anybody watching at home, um, you can raise your hands too. <laughs> we'll pretend like we can process the results. I think we have a good idea of how people are going to vote. So um, anybody who plays Monopoly, um, what do you do here? Uh, when you land on free parking. Uh, do you get all the money that's in the middle in the kitty? Or do like you that. just sit there? And I'll take a poll of our studio audience here today. Um, who thinks that you get the, all the money in the middle? Who thinks that you get to just sit on free parking? We've got a stack deck here, <laughs> but everybody here seems to think you get the money in the middle. Greg, what do you get? No, you, you, get the rules you get nothing. You get nothing and you like it. Read the rules on the inside of the box sometimes. It actually, they've become so irritated about that, they've actually folded that part of the rule that says you get nothing. <laughs> but here's the nice thing, anybody who's got um, kids, you know, when they bring home a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you all sit down and play Monopoly, you can change the rules in your own box. You can cross things out and you usually advise everybody um, in the fan, that everybody in the family initial that. But say these are the house rules. If you come here, we get the money in the middle. Just like all you people here, then you can keep the money. And who cares what, what, what boyfriends think? Yeah, and I, I have had our box top notarized so that um, just the added level of protection. But you but yeah. but, but here, here's another thing to remember too. The rules don't have to be what the rules in the box are. Right. And they also don't have to be the same for everybody as long as it's in writing. So that family member who's got a job for life, okay, um, but it has to be in writing and it has to be approved by free, the free parking for dad only, that's the rule in a lot of places and it works just fine. So let's get that in writing too. These next, uh, the next four, yes, four rules are um, fairly simple. We've got some quick hitters here. Restrict the ownership group. Yeah. That just makes sense. Less is more. A lot of, um, a lot of buy, sell, uh, documents are um, start with the restriction on who you can sell to or who can be owners and that's important because even minority owners can be disruptive and so you, you're more likely to have buy-in if you have uh, voluntary owners or, or people who came in through the family and who knew what they were getting into 
be thorough, make sure that all the governing documents and the estate planning documents and prenuptial agreements, that they all agree with the, uh, the buy-sell agreements. This is another question of philosophy um, and getting everybody on the same page. Everybody should agree in concept to the fact that we have to keep this group as small as possible. Um, even if it seems really large on the outside, we don't want to make it any bigger because there's only so many cats that you can herd. And following up on that then, preserve exit strategies. Um, if you're going to restrict the ownership group, well, even if you aren't, you need to give people an, an opportunity to take their investment and leave. Uh, and, uh, and so that always reminds me. Get, of, yeah, give the, give the, the, uh, play. <laughs> the brief version of this. So I had four semesters of French in college, and I was functionally illiterate by the time, in French language by the time I finished. But in the third semester, we had an assignment. We were supposed to go see this uh, play, No Exit by Jean-Paul Sartre, that was being uh, performed on campus. I got there. What I didn't know was that it was being performed in French. And so I got nothing out of it at the time, except that it was three French people shouting at each other for whatever, an hour and a half. But it looked interesting enough, and so I went back and read an English language translation. And <laughs> what to do for any French class? What it turns out, it turns out that um, what they were doing was they were in this hotel room, and it was a love triangle. The man was he was in love with her. She was she hated him, but was in love with her. She hated her, but was in love with him. And so that was what they were arguing about, and how despicable they thought they were, and all of that. And at the end, it's like Hotel California, you can check out, but you can never leave. They find out that they're in hell, that this hotel room, they can't ever leave, and they're damned to being with, with people that they love and hate and can't um, leave them. And then the, the tagline, I mean, if it was a movie, would be hell is other people. That's what uh, people think of. And if you're, a, if you're a minority owner stuck in a family business, that's what it can be. If you're the majority. If you've got if you've got three siblings together, for example, and and two of them are against one, it's hell for the other two. Um, it's just a bad situation and an unworkable one. So have that exit strategy be part of the planning that everybody talks about. It's absolutely essential. Seven then, is important, very important. Know the value. Um, we work closely with valuation experts um, in. Um, helping to set up good governance structures, and then later on when there are disputes and trying to resolve those disputes, uh, valuation is important. People typically don't know, uh, minority shareholders in particular, don't know the value to the business. And what they think that they know can be a really dangerous recipe because they may overvalue the business, they may know things anecdotally, um, and that misunderstanding can lead to unnecessary fights. So we like to have the valuation done at the beginning of the planning process. It sets, the, it sets everybody's expectations, and it, it also uh, helps us better plan in terms of funding people's exit strategies. Number eight, um, I have a hard time saying this one out loud, but it's my slide to talk about discourage litigation. No, I, I really do think um, that there, there's plenty of work for me to do regardless because some people just don't take good advice no matter how many times you give it. But it doesn't mean that we can't um, offer some insight but knowing how bad things get families being destroyed for no good reason, um, things that can be avoided. So I would discourage litigation. Um, a quick <laughs> explanation I give to people, oops, back on here again. Uh, you know, you, you think about a, a case that ends up in, in litigation, you're talking about two years of fights most likely, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees, and likely people who are no happier at the end than they are in the beginning. It's just the reality. Regardless of who's perceived as the winner or loser later, there's a lot of uh, uh, horror stories to tell that all uh, corporate attorneys we work with and us litigation attorneys can share. Um, and they're important for people to know because there are always alternatives. And the corollary to that is provide for um, alternative dispute resolution. So this might be one method here on the slide, but uh, mediation. It's better than some. Mediation, arbitration. And, and really those need to be consistent across the, the documents and contracts. There is almost no reason to not try to figure things out first. And sometimes you can't always do it yourself. Sometimes you need a skilled third party mediator to come in, um, somebody who is familiar with the family uh, that can help resolve a dispute. Uh, it's always worth consideration. So I hope we've answered everybody's questions and you have none left. But if you do, um, that's why we're here.
Ah, one question. From the one question line. Uh, let's take this the, the first one. Which of the nine recommendations is the most important? Um, so I think that there are two that are most important. <laughs> one is really that insight as to the four. The first one. Yeah, the first yeah. one. With the four purposes or objectives of owning a family business. That really opens up the conversation and allows you to tailor the plan. It tells you how you structure it and the business. But the second one, what? Valuation? Valuation, yeah. Uh, the valuation is so important, knowing what is possible in terms of exit strategies, what people could live on if they sold their interest in the business, what they can expect. Just really essential. And if you can only invest in one part of the planning process in the first year, I would say get that valuation done and then come to us the next year and we'll start there. So thanks for your time this morning. We really appreciate it. We have our names, phone numbers, emails uh, on there. Feel free to follow up with us, but it's been a, a pleasure talking to you. Thanks.